is so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise and to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood. the healing cleansing flood Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. For grace to trust Him more Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I've proved Him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him more Rise 
Savior 
morning and welcome to church. Good to have you all here. Uh, we got um, some wonderful things lined up for you this morning. We've got worship, we've got prayer, we've got, even got something for the kids. So kids, hang on, uh, Talia's prepared something for you. And of course, we'll get stuck into God's Word, Acts chapter 26. We'll go through that and uh, just dive into it a little bit more in, more in detail. But good to have you with us. But as we gather together to worship today, it's good to remember that we are and we're uh, tuned in, uh, not for ourselves as much as to bring glory to God and to worship our great Creator. And so let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can join this morning. Thank you for dying for us on that cross and rising again. You are the resurrection and the life. Lord, we rejoice today in the blessings that you have brought to us uh, by that resurrection. Uh, Lord, you are Saviour and have met every power of evil and have overcome the enemy. And so this morning, Lord, we have nothing to fear in death. For you have proved yourself Lord over death and have the keys to the grave and that you will rescue us from death's power. And Lord, we thank you that even as we come this morning that you are with us, you're present with us, you're there to um, reassure us that you love us. We thank you for these promises and we pray that even now as we take this time out to worship you and, and sing and, and praise you, Lord, that we would draw closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. G'day guys, welcome to Kids and Youth Church. I'm Jordan and this is Liv. We've got some fun and exciting stories to tell you. Lockdown may be boring, but it doesn't have to be. Hey Liv, I got a joke for you. What do you got? How do you get a country girl's attention? Oh, I don't know. A tractor. <laughs> I got one for you too, Jordan. So why do nurses always use a red crayon? Why? Because they draw blood. <laughs> we got a lot of stuff to cover, so over to the news. Good morning, good midday, good afternoon. You're watching Bribey Island News, Stories and Entertainment. I'm Jade Knowledge. And I'm Sally Absolutely. The latest trend to hit social media this COVID lockdown is the money trap, said to be a clean and safe way to earn extra money through this COVID pandemic. Let's take a look. Douglas, over to you. G'day guys, here we are in an official game of Money Trap. The contestant can keep any money they pick up. Let's see how he does. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't found any money yet. There you go. <laughs> Where are <laughs> That wraps it up for today with this man's success. And my pain. For now, we'll go back over to the news. <laughs> well, that looks safe. Well, today we have an exclusive interview with the man commonly known by the alias, The Man on the Mat. But first, let's have a look at the backstory. One day, while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? 
Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately, every, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe as they praised God, exclaiming, We have seen amazing things today. Well, this is exciting. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. So, is it true that before you met Jesus, you couldn't walk? Ah, uh, yes, that is. But even worse than that, because I didn't know Jesus, my sins weren't forgiven. That puts me in an even worse position than not walking. What do you mean? Well, being paralyzed is one thing in life, but not having my sins dealt with, that would mean endless tragedy, not only now, but even when I die. Mm. If I had any sin in my life, I would be judged and I would suffer even bigger than if I was paralyzed. But thankfully, Jesus healed me in both ways. He healed my legs and my sin problem. Now I'm a free man and I won't be judged when I die. Wow, that's amazing. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we close off this segment? Well, a shout out to my faithful friends, because they were the ones who lowered me down and without them, I wouldn't have met Jesus that day. Oh. Well, I've got one more question to ask you. We're dying to know. Are you willing to reveal your, new na your real name on camera? Sally, that's off script. It's okay. Um, my real name is Barry, Barry Wiggletoes. <laughs> I know. That's why I took on the alias. I see. Oh, sorry I asked. Now for the weather. The weather? It's 19 degrees. It's a bit chilly. It's a sunny day and there's no chance of rain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all we have time for today, Sally. That's right, Jade. One final note. Jesus is alive and active in our everyday lives doing more than we can imagine. Barry Wiggletoes has shown us in more ways than one how Jesus came through for him. The question is, will you trust Jesus with your struggles? Will you boldly declare what Jesus has done for you? More stories about faithful followers next week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jade Knowledge. I'm Sally, absolutely. You're watching Bribe Island's news, stories, and entertainment. See you next time. Well, that was super insightful. Barry Wiggletoes, what a character. Alright, now it's time for the verse of the day. Ella, Sammy, on to you guys. So my favourite verse is Jeremiah 29 verse 11, which says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This verse is my favourite because whenever I'm struggling to know what my purpose in life is or what my plan will be for in the future, it shows me that God does have a plan for my life and that he's in control so then I don't have to stress as much about it. So I'm doing Psalm 29. The Lord gives strength to his people and the Lord blesses his people with peace. Thanks girls. This is Liv and Jordan. See you next time. Ciao. Alrighty, just for some announcements, if you can, please. Uh, um, the first is this, that uh, tonight, uh, tonight's service, our 5 p.m. service will be on Zoom. A link was emailed to you. If you don't have it, please email info at bribebaptist.com, info at bribebaptist.com, and we'll e email you that link. So that's for Sunday service. 5 p.m. and also then on Monday Zoom pre meeting please at 7 p.m. and also same the link will be emailed to you or you can just simply ask for the link at info at bribebaptist.com. Uh, you will also remember I shared to you about a family camp that's coming up. If you'd like more info, uh, please uh, also email us and we'll give you all the the information available. Uh, also, don't forget that we're collecting boxes for Operation Christmas Child, and so during these times, if you're at home and uh, you've got nothing to do, just uh, think of those that are less fortunate and uh, put together a box for them. Um, 
That would be wonderful. If you do not get our newsletter and want to hear all about what's happening during the week, please also don't, uh, rem don't forget to email us at info at brabybaptist.com. It was unfortunate that few of our events are cancelled, uh, but Lord willing, after the lockdown is over, the bookshop will be open, coffee shop will be open, and things will resume as normal. There are some important prayer requests at the moment for those that know Jenny House. Her father has passed away, and there'll be a small little family funeral at the church on Monday. Um, for those who know Thelma and uh, uh, Thelma Farrell, her husband passed away, uh, and so please pray for Thelma and the family as they uh, mourn a loved one, but a but a man who loved Jesus and is in heaven, seated next to the right hand of the Father. Also, please pray for those that are getting over from sickness. Uh, pray for um, those that are struggling especially with this whole lockdown. And then also, uh, for those that don't know, Phil Albury passed away in some tragic circumstances. Please pray for his family. I think that's all the announcements. The other is, please uh, don't forget tithes and offerings. Um, our ministries must continue. Uh, our staff must be paid. So please, if you can do that online, use the link um, uh, I know that some of you be, haven't been able to come and, and drop your money, but please, if you can, do it online or even do a debit order so that it just comes off automatically. That would be wonderful. Um, the link will be um, sent below. Thank you.
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Why don't you turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 26. Now, we did go through it last week, but I almost feel that we didn't do enough justice to it uh, last week, and so I want to go through it again, uh, summarize it, and look, repetition is good, and uh, highlight some other things that I think are important uh, in this passage. I'm not going to read the passage, but I'm going to go through it, and so we, we will read it as we go through it. So please, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 26. Now this morning I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation, which is just a little bit easier to read. Now by way of introduction, let's, let me just tell you a story. Um, my sister and family, we were sitting around the table one night for a meal to which my sister said, uh, I have a friend coming around for dinner tomorrow night, to which we all said, oh that's great, that's good. Uh, so uh, mum had to prepare another meal, and then to which my sister replied to me, and Ray, don't try and convert them. Now, I think I, think I know what my sister was saying. My sister was saying, hey, listen, uh, I don't want you to talk about Jesus all the time, uh, but she used the word convert, and I've been to other places and I've been in, involved in some organizations where people would say, listen, you're welcome to come and visit us or whatever, but we don't want you to proselytize. We don't want you to convert anybody. And so convert has become a bad word. To convert from something to another has become a, a bad word. But in, in essence, the word convert is an absolutely wonderful word. And it's not just a word that is used amongst um, Christians. It's used in the world today. So um, uh, not so long ago, Apple, uh, for those who are Apple lovers, 
you will know that um, people who worked in Apple shops used to have a T-shirt, and the T-shirt would say on the back, I've been converted. And the whole idea was that they'd been converted from Apple to Microsoft. And uh, I pray this conversion takes more and more place for all my Microsoft friends out there. Uh, but that was the thing. So they understand what the word conversion means. For many people, conversion is a dirty word. For Paul, it wasn't a dirty word. For Paul, it was a life-changing experience that turned his life around. And I think that's what the passage this morning highlights for us. The beautiful change where it changes somebody's life around. And so uh, I've, over the years, had people come to me and say, Pastor Ray, um, please, I have a teenage daughter. Won't you speak to them and help them to change? And my response is always, listen, I'd love to meet them, but it's Jesus Christ who changes their hearts, not me. Not my words, but Jesus Christ in their life that changes it. And so conversion is the most beautiful, the most wonderful thing in the world. And Paul has the opportunity in chapter 26 of explaining his conversion before dignitaries, before high-ranking people, before a king and, and his entourage. Paul has this wonderful, wonderful opportunity of explaining how God has changed his life. And so this morning, I want to go through these verses, uh, but I want to explain it and share with you and use some, let's say, uh, poetic license to be able to help the story come in alive in your heart. So follow with me from Acts chapter 26 and verse 1. Paul has to now give an account before everybody that's gathered and so Paul starts and he gestures with his hand and he says to them, I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you are the one hearing my defense today. And so he says to Agrippa, uh, thanks for letting me stand here this morning and share with you what God has done in my life. And I know that you know something about uh, Jewish history, the customs, about our prophets, and I know you know all of that stuff. So please just give me a chance, listen to me patiently as I share with you a little bit of what's happened to me. He starts on and he says, As the Jewish leaders were well aware, I was given thorough Jewish training. And so Paul highlights the fact that Yuri was not just a person, but he was a Jew. He was the elect of the Jews. He was trained in all this Jewish theology, and he was trained in Jewish history and everything. And so he was a well-trained uh, man in Jewish uh, history, and so he knows everything about the Bible. And so he explains that to them. And he says, without any hesitancy that he is on trial because of something, not that he did, but of something that he saw in the Bible, a promise that was made million years ago in the Old Testament to his ancestors. And he says, in fact, that is why the 12 tribes of Israel zealously worship God day and night, that they may share the same hope I have. And so he explains the fact that it's not just him, but everybody shares that same hope that a Messiah would come and one day be able to save the world from their sins. And then he speaks about the resurrection of the dead. And he speaks about, and he says to Agrippa, Agrippa, you've got to understand, it was the resurrection of Jesus that made this whole plan come together. Agrippa, listen to me, please, I'm telling you. It was Jesus' resurrection that pulled this all together. He goes on to say, I used to believe that I ought to do everything and could oppose the very name of Jesus. He talks about his past and, and what he was and the way he used to behave, saying that he went around uh, on instructions by, uh, by these priests 
to go and, uh, and um, arrest Christians and even to the point of condemning them to death. And so he explains to Grippa his past and his, how zealous he was in, in, in Judaism and what he, the, the lengths he went to in order to fulfill what he thought was right. And he says that he speaks about this man named Jesus, of which everybody would have been aware at that time. And he talks about them opposing. And he says, I even chased them down to foreign cities. But here comes the crunch. He talks about what happened. The day life change took place for him. He says one day he was on that mission to Damascus with his authority from the priests when a light from heaven brighter than the sun shone down on me and my companions. And he says, right there and then, Agrippa, I fell to my knees and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. We spoke about this last week, that he, he mentions the fact that he was being goaded. And we spoke about the stick that is a goad. And he says that, Paul says, you're not persecuting my people, but you're persecuting me. Paul responds uh, with the words, who are you, Lord, I asked. And he said, I am Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. And so now suddenly for everything, Paul becomes alive and he recognizes who is speaking. It's Jesus, the same one he's been persecuting. Paul is told to get to his feet, and then he is told about his calling. He says, Paul, you're not worthy. You've been killing people, chasing people. You're not worthy. But even through all of that, I have called you and appointed you to take the gospel to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and to the Gentiles. And what is the gospel? that you share with them the good news and the repentance of sins and a turning towards God. And at that time, after God had told me to do these things, um, some Jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this. And so Paul goes on to explain to Agrippa, I'm doing exactly what God told me, and yet I'm being punished for it. And then he says, but Agrippa, I've got to tell you this, that God protected me. Every time this happened, I was protected, and they couldn't do anything to me. And you can imagine the Jews sitting and listening to this as Paul unfolds the story. And I wonder, I wonder, there's some part of me inside says to me, I wonder if Luke wrote this and gave this around to prove that his testimony was true. He says, but all of this, Paul says, but God protected me. Not man, not the church, but God protected me. Well, look what happens. Verse 24, Festus shouts, Paul, you're too insane. Too much study has made you crazy. And so you can see Festus, he's had, he heard enough of all of this stuff. He's like my sister who says, hey, I don't want you to convert my friend. And Festus, he doesn't want to hear any more of this. And he says to Paul, Paul, you're insane. Too much teaching is, has messed up with your brain. And in that, he kind of gives Paul a compliment because what he's saying to Paul is, hey, Paul, you're super intelligent, buddy, but I think these books have done too much to your brain. And so he recognizes that Paul is a very intelligent man. This is not just anybody. This is a very, very intelligent man and who knows exactly what he's talking about. But maybe the books have just got into his brain. It's a masterpiece of a testimony. He says to Agrippa, Agrippa, I, I'm changed. I'm a changed man. I was somebody that killed people for knowing Jesus. But now all I do is talk about Jesus and what he did on the cross and his resurrection 
so that everybody might know that this is our King Messiah. Then everything turns around. He says to King Agrippa, verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the Old Testament? Do you believe the promise of the Messiah? Do you believe what God said about the Messiah he would do? Because <laughs> if you do, Agrippa, then you know what I'm saying is not a lie. Well, Agrippa interrupts him with one of the most famous verses in the Bible. He says, do you think that you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? I like that. Do you think you can persuade me? It's not men's words that persuade people to become Christians. It's the spirit of God inside people highlighting their need for a saviour for Jesus Christ. Paul replies, I love his reply, humble reply. He replies, quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am except for these chains. You can see Paul's humility and his love just shining through. What Paul wants is Paul wants others to have the cure for cancer. Paul wants them to have life. That's why people share the word of God. That's why people preach. You see, uh, when I grew up, everybody would be talking about evangelistic program. You've got to do this program. You've got to have this at your church. You've got to do this. You have to go out on Saturday to houses or whatever. And, and I do love programs. Believe you me, I love programs. But I think we forgot that we, programs are not to take away from who we are. You see, the minute this change comes into our life, we automatically want to give the cure to others. It becomes normal. If it's not, then maybe we don't have the cure. But if we do have the cure, if our life has been changed, we will want to do it. And so it should not necessarily be a program. It should be something that comes out of our pores, something that comes out of our blood, something that comes out of our mouths. We want other people to have what we have. That's what Paul is saying. Festus, if not you, but I want everybody sitting here, all you kings, you dignitaries, you military people, I want you to have what I have. My life was changed, renewed, regenerated. I want that for you. I can imagine Gripper just sitting listening to this all. Well, it didn't take long for them, the king. Verse 30, governor and Bernice and all the others stood up and left and they went out and they talked it over and over and agreed this man has done nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. They agreed. And if they agreed, why weren't they strong enough just to say, Paul, go free and say to the Jewish leaders, there is nothing here, guys. There's nothing to charge him with. Clearly, this man is a changed man. But you and I know that the Bible says to some Christians are a beautiful smell, to others it's the stench of death. Well, that's the story. It's a beautiful story as I relate it to you this morning. But it's a story of conversion. You might be asking me this morning, what does it mean to convert? What does it mean for somebody to be converted? Well, let me, let me just say this. First of all, that conversion is when somebody opens their eyes up to see themselves for what they are and see God for what he's like. And let's be honest, in most times, this is a miraculous event. See, because the truth about it is, is that there are many people walking around thinking, I'm great, I'm good, I don't need God. That's the way they walk around. But for those whose eyes have been opened, 
They recognize their status. And though even though they might be good people, they recognize that before God they are not good and therefore in desperate need of God. And then they recognize how great God is and that there's this wonderful, almighty God that is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-seeing. And so the first thing to take place is for people's eyes to be opened up. There needs to be this conviction of sin and a, a response to that and saying, God, I don't want to be the same anymore. I want to be different. I want to be changed by the power of the Spirit. I want my life not to be the same. And then to walk away from all of that and say, hey, listen, this is not what I want for my life. Paul's conversion is but one part of his uh, defense, but most of the verses there are are, are about his conversion, this evolution and this radical radical transformation, a change from darkness to light, from death to life, a change from persecuting Christianity to practicing and promoting it. That's what takes place. But the other thing that, that takes place here is the, something which we call inside of people uh, the choice. Now, a lot of people uh, sometimes struggle with what part God does and what you do. You see, because the reality is that God gives us a new heart. He does. But there's this other part to it is that once we have been changed by God, that we need to do something active in, in order to, um, to work this out. And I, I want to just elaborate with you a little bit about that this morning. So this morning, what, what I want us to see is the fact that we, that God does his part in the fact that he gives us a new heart. But there's a part that we need to do to interact this conversion. Uh, So let me talk about that a little bit. Uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 14 says, You ought to walk as obedient children. Romans 6 verse 16 says, Don't you realize that you you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. And so there's an important part that we need to do in this whole process, is that we need to become children of obedience. Now listen, let me just tell you this. I know this. I'm a father. Obedience is a dirty word, all right? We don't like obedience, none of us. People don't want to wear a mask. They don't want to be locked down in their homes. I understand that. I have the same problem. We are rebellious people by nature. We don't want to obey. But I can tell you this, obedience is a sign of somebody whose heart has changed. Paul, uh, what does he do? As soon as his life is is changed, he's obedient and he does what God called him to do. And that is a very important part of obedience. So number one, obedience is a mark of conversion. Secondly, obedience, it's a recognition of authority. It recognizes that there's somebody else in control, not me. I'm not trying to control everything, but that there's God. He's in control. Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter says, You judge whether we ought to obey God or man. You have that choice. God lays down the principles. You either choose God or you choose to obey man. And thirdly, obedience is a character, characteristic of faith. It's a wonderful characteristic of faith. If you go through Hebrews and you read the 11th chapter, you will see it says about these people. They were people of faith. Verse 8 says, And Abraham obeyed God, and the next verse, by faith. They obeyed by faith. Let me explain what that means, because just to help us understand that. Um, you see, we obey our parents, even though sometimes 
They might not be right, but we obey them because we believe them and we have faith in them. And that's why sometimes people uh, obey leaders and get into trouble. But essentially it's because you have faith in them. And, and rightly, we shouldn't put our faith in leaders. We should put our faith in God because leaders make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. But why do we obey? Because we've got great faith in these, le- in these leaders. Why do we obey God? Because we've got great faith in God because what God said, he does. And so whatever God says, I have faith and I obey that because God is right, God is good, and he will know what's right for us. Fourthly, obedience is proof of love. There's a wonderful verse in the Bible that says this, If you love me, you will obey my commands. And whoever keeps my commands is the one who loves me. And so today, it's no good us saying, I love Jesus, and then disobeying the rules. People who have a changed life and a changed heart are people who are obedient to the gospel. People who are obedient. And obedience is a proof of love. If you love somebody, you will want to obey what they're doing. Uh, Spurgeon tells the story. (laughs) He says that uh, he was uh, walking home one night when a drunk man came up to him in his uh, his, uh, blubbering mess and said to him, Hey, Spurgeon, uh, you are, um, I am one of your converts. And Spurgeon said he could just smell the alcohol coming from this man's breath as he spluttered his words. And Spurgeon said to him, You might be one of my converts, but you're definitely not one of Jesus Christ's converts. You see, the truth is, at the end of the day, is that conversion doesn't only need conviction and a calling and an opening of the eyes, but conversion needs obedience. Let God do his part and let us do our part in this whole beautiful process of conversion. I started to tell you that conversion for many is a dirty word. But I'm reminded of stories all throughout the centuries of people whose lives were changed. And I wished I could even get somebody up here this morning to tell you a story about how their life was changed when they came to know know Jesus. I was a 16-year-old boy when, when I came to know Jesus. My life was on the wrong path. I can't look back over those days and say, yes, I made the right choices. I did the right things with my life. I can tell you about one choice that I made. I chose Jesus Christ. And I, like Paul, say the very thing that Paul said. Agrippa, I'm not just interested in you coming to know Christ. But every single person who's listening to this broadcast today, every single person, that they too would have this special encounter with Jesus Christ, the same as Paul had. Not so much the the light from heaven or whatever, but the changed heart, the changed life. That's my prayer for you as it's my prayer for me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the beauty of conversion, the beauty of a changed heart, the beauty of a changed life. Lord, we pray for open eyes to see ourselves as we really are and see you as you really are. Help us to remember, Lord, to come under, to fall off at your feet of obedience and to serve you according to what you want. This is our prayer as a, as a church. This is, my prayer, uh, uh, this is my prayer as pastor. In this place we pray for all until Jesus comes again. Amen. Come thou found 
of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming Here's my heart, oh. 